Hello, everyone. Uh, good morning and good evening. Uh, my name is Hang Yun Ma. I'm the professor of international studies at the Catholic University of Korea. Uh, it is my honor uh, that I was invited to this very uh, important session of the KAIS conference today. Uh, the inauguration of President Biden uh, took place uh, just one month ago. Uh, and after four uh, chaotic years under the President Trump, uh, many people in the world uh, seem to uh, breathe a sigh of relief uh, when uh, Joe Biden won the November election uh, 2020. Uh, however, it was more than bizarre, I think, when uh, incumbent president uh, last year, who obviously lost the election, uh, uh, declared that actually he won the election and, and resisted uh, to uh, the, the due process of uh, uh, tr transition. Uh, restoration uh, seems to be the, the first motto of the new U.S. administration. Uh, restoration of American democracy, uh, American leadership in the world, uh, liberal international order, and America's uh, alliance network, and then et cetera. President Biden has repeatedly uh, emphasized uh, America is back and diplomacy is back uh, too. But uh, there's a question, back to where? Uh, to the time of the uh, Obama administration where President Biden himself and many other uh, policymakers of the current administration belong to and work with? The change of the American political leadership will surely have great implications for the world and its order, for better or worse. It may be a little uh, premature to talk about the Biden uh, administration's foreign policy and its impact on the world order, because it's been just a month in, in office. Uh, it is quite uncertain uh, as to the direction of the Biden foreign policy and the chance of its success uh, and, and so on. Of course, the new administration is currently in the process of uh, policy review and we will soon uh, begin to see how that policy will reveal itself. Many countries and people in the world uh, greeted the leadership change in the America uh, and reporters and uh, foreign uh, relations experts and bureaucrats no longer need to be surprised by the Trump's uh, tweets. And that's a good thing, I think. Uh, and there's a much hope for the success of the Biden administration's foreign policy, but there are lingering concerns too. Uh, but we are very lucky today uh, to have uh, distinguished scholars uh, gathered uh, here today, online and offline, uh, from Seoul and from the United States, who will discuss some changes in global order after the inauguration of uh, President Biden and Biden administration. We will listen to their expert views on the prospect of uh, US foreign policy under the new administration and its, its implications for the international order, international order at large and in, in the East Asian region in particular. Here we have three presenters and another three uh, discussants. Uh, our presenters include uh, Charles Kup, Professor Charles Kupchen, uh, the senior fellow at the uh, Council of Foreign Relations and Professor of International Affairs at Georgetown University. And we also have uh, Professor Steve Chun, uh, professor at uh, University of Colorado Boulder. Uh, he is currently a college professor of distinction. And our third presenter is Professor Dong Sun Lee of Korea University. And we have three uh, dis designated uh, discussants, uh, Professor Son Byung Won, of Chungang University, Professor Park Jae-jok of Hankook University of Foreign Relations, Foreign Studies, I'm sorry, and thirdly, uh, Professor Lee Ji-young of American University. 
Uh, each presenter will have uh, 15 minutes, uh, but perhaps somehow extended to 20. And after presentation of three, pre three papers, uh, discussions will follow. I'll give about uh, 10 minutes for each uh, discussant. Uh, without further ado, I will ask our first presenter, Professor uh, Charles Kupchan, to start. Uh, Charles, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Can okay. you hear me? Okay, then you, you can go ahead. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, for calling our conference to order, and, and uh, thanks to KIS for organizing organizing the event at this, uh, I guess, historic moment in American politics and also in American engagement in um, in world affairs. The, the the short version of the argument that I that I want to begin with tonight is is the following: that we've been through two extended periods of American statecraft since 1789. The first period ran from the founding era until 1941, and I would call that the era of isolationism, in which the United States was deeply engaged in the world economically, culturally, religiously. Its missionaries were roaming around uh, all parts of the world. But in general, the US stayed out of strategic involvement beyond the homeland. Uh, it temporarily engaged in the, the war of 18, uh, excuse me, the war of 1898, war, World War I in 1917, but then didn't like the entanglement that it found. And it went back to observe the advice of the founding fathers. George Washington said in 1796, we want commercial connections with everyone, political connections to no one. Thomas Jefferson said the country should avoid entangling alliances. And so this was a long period in which the United States generally embraced aversion to strategic entanglement outside its neighborhood. That all comes to an end in 1941 with the bombing of Pearl Harbor and the US swings to the opposite end of the spectrum unstinting internationalism. Hundreds of thousands of American troops stay on station in peacetime after the end of World War II and during the Cold War. We still have hundreds of bases all over the world. And that era of what I would call liberal internationalism ran from Franklin Roosevelt's presidency through Barack Obama's presidency. It ended on January 20th, 2017 with the inauguration of Donald Trump. And moments after his inauguration, President Trump said, it's America first, it's only America first. And he was taking the country back to 1940 when the America First Committee opened to prevent President Roosevelt from getting the United States involved in World War II. So in many respects, he was taking the country back to an older brand of statecraft. And although many people said that Trump was breaking with the American tradition, American identity, uh, who we are as Americans, he was going back to an earlier brand of statecraft that was isolationist, unilateralist, protectionist, and nativist, because that was how the United States ran its statecraft for many, many decades. The problem is that uh, Trump overcorrected. He, he, in my mind, correctly responded to what he took to be a powerful sentiment in the American electorate. And that sentiment was too much world, not enough America. Too many wars, too much free trade, too many immigrants, too many alliances, too many pacts. And I think that's a sentiment that many Americans shared, especially after the forever wars that came after 9-11. But rather than realigning American statecraft with American means and purposes, Trump vastly overcorrected. He took a wrecking ball to the world that America made. He tried to cordon the United States off from a world 
in which we are irretrievably and irreversibly tethered. You can't go back to the 1930s when the United States did remove itself from global geopolitics. It's not possible. So where I think Mr. Biden is today is he needs to correct for Trump's overcorrection. He can't go back to where we were before Trump because as I said, I think there are many Americans who feel that there has been too much world and not enough America. There are many Americans who fear that globalization did not work for them. And that's why Mr. Biden has been talking since the beginning about a foreign policy for the middle class. What does all that mean? We don't know yet because as our chair said, it is still early on in the Biden administration. But let me, be, uh, let me just kind of sketch out where I think Biden is going to head. Uh, and I'll, uh, I'll sketch it out in broad terms and then I'll come back to where I think he'll be with, with uh, specifically on the question of, of Northeast Asia. In two important respects, two critical respects, I think uh, President Biden is already going the distance to fix the big mistakes that Trump made. Uh, and I share uh, the chair's uh, comment that uh, we can all breathe a sigh of relief. Uh, I, I, uh, Steve uh, is, is um, also here in the United States. Um, I think Professor Lee is also in the United States. I'm not sure, but it's been an unrecognizable period in American history, uh, a scary period. I never thought I would be living through anything resembling the last four years ever. Uh, and in that respect, we have, we have been, uh, we have to learn lessons from the Trump era, not turn our back on it, ask how did this happen? Where did he come from? How did he take the country down the path? And what can we do to make sure it never happens again? So there are two ways that I think uh, Mr. Biden is, is going to correct for Trump's errant statecraft, and he's already begun to do so. One is to take the US back to multilateralism and being a team player. He's already rejoined the Paris Agreement. He's already said we're not leaving the World Health Organization. His first calls were to NATO allies. He's already beginning to re-engage Iran on the nuclear deal. In other words, he understands that in a globalized world, going it alone is not an option. And the second area where I think we're seeing a very needed and urgent course correction is on democracy, human rights, values. Uh, it has been very painful to me personally to live through a period in which the American president turned his back on democratic allies and favored Vladimir Putin, Mr. Erdogan, the president of Turkey, Mr. El-Sisi, the leader of Egypt. Where was the United States when it came to standing up for the values that it has represented since 1789. It was missing in action. And you now have in the Oval Office someone who cares about American values, who cares about liberal democracy, who is a decent human being, who will not mix up fact and fiction, who will not say, I won an election after 50 states have said, no, Mr. Trump, you lost the election. Uh, and so we are going back to a world in which people look to the United States as a leader, respect the United States, and want to emulate the United States. Those two changes, the return to multilateralism and the restoration of the American presidency as uh, an office that people look to for leadership, these are enormous, important, critical changes. My one caveat, and it is a big caveat, is that I think Mr. Biden has to be a domestic policy president. And that's because we have lived through a near-death experience over the last four years for American democracy. And as I said, our task is not to turn our backs on the Trump era, but to make sure it never happens again. And that means to me, investing in pandemic recovery, investing 
in infrastructure, green technology, child care, health care, racial justice. The list goes on and on and on. We're looking at trillions and trillions of dollars of domestic expenditure to try to repair the country, to try to speak to the 74 million Americans that just voted for Donald Trump. Clearly, there is disaffection, there is discontent, there is anger in the American state. And the task before us, in my mind, is to repair the country because strength abroad starts with strength at home. Biden needs to maintain control of Congress if he's going to implement his domestic agenda. That's gonna require speaking to these serious domestic problems. So I think we all need to keep in mind that Biden will focus like a laser on domestic policy because he has to. And when he says this was an election for the soul of America, I think he means it. I think he, he, he says this is about the future of the United States as a liberal democracy. So what, what does that mean for, for American foreign policy? I think number one, it means fewer polit resources, both political and economic. I think Biden will continue to withdraw from the Middle East to downsize the US footprint. I would be very surprised if he accepts the advice of a blue ribbon panel to increase force levels in Afghanistan. Americans have had it with the forever wars. They want out. A second area where I think you'll see continuation is on trade. Free trade has become a bit of a dirty word on both sides of the aisle. And that's because even though the liberalization of the global economy worked well for large American companies, it did not work well for a lot of working Americans. They have been on the losing end of globalization They've seen wages decline. They've seen manufacturing jobs disappear. They've seen their $30 an hour union jobs be replaced by eight or $9 an hour working at Walmart or at McDonald's. And that's one of the main reasons there is so much anger out there in the American heartland. A third area where I think you'll see more continuity is on institutionalized multilateralism. The Republicans have lost their appetite for treaty-based institutional building, order building. Uh, I, it's hard for me to imagine any treaty making it through the Senate these days, which requires two thirds of the Senate to vote it forward. So I think there'll be lots of multilateralism, but it will be informal ad hoc coalitions of the willing executive agreements like the Paris Agreement and the Iran nuclear deal, simply because we don't have an option. We can't get something like the Iran deal or the Paris Climate Agreement through the Senate. The downside of that is that they can be pulled down by the if another party comes to power. And that's why it is so important, I think, for Biden to build public support for multilateralism, to have a foreign policy for the middle class, because ultimately he's going to need to have public support for engagement abroad, given that the Republican Party seems to be moving so far in the other direction. My final, my final comment, to the degree that there is one area of the world that will be least affected by the changes in American foreign policy that I'm talking about, I think it is your part of the world. And that's because there is a bipartisan consensus to stand firm in Northeast Asia, in the Asia Pacific in general, largely because of the rise of China and because the situation on the Korean Peninsula and North Korea's nuclear program remains a serious problem for the United States. I see two opportunities pre that present themselves. One is that I think Mr. Biden will be as open to the advice of allies as any American president in modern history. And that's because he will be sensitive to what allies bring to the table. And he wants to be rebuild a democratic coalition of allies 
particularly on China, but more broadly. So I think there's a real opportunity here for Seoul to make its views felt, to take a position on how they think the on how you think the United States should deal with Pyongyang. Because I think you will you you have an open door when it comes to being able to influence views in Washington and contribute to common tasks. The final comment I would make is that uh, I, I think it would also be useful for South Korea, Japan, and others in the in the um, region to help guide the United States on China. Uh, because our China policy is a work in progress right now. I fear that there'll be a, a, a kind of uniform view that uh, we, have to, we have to go hard on China because of the domestic politics of the issue here. I don't know. Hear you here? Uh, Professor Kupchan, uh, we could not really hear you uh, ever since you began to talk about uh, China. Uh, there seems to be some uh, problem, uh, technical problems. So okay, okay, can you? I think for repeat? some reason my my uh, microphone turned off, but now it's back on. Okay, good. Okay. Um, so my my <clears throat> my main point here was simply the importance of weighing in on China policy because Biden wants to have a united front of democracies when it comes to China. I don't think that will be easy. We just saw the Europeans go off and forge their own investment treaty. Uh, so there is, in my mind, a real opportunity here for Seoul, for Tokyo, for others in the region to help shape American policy toward China, which I think will be particularly important at a time in which we do seem to be heading toward a very intense competition between the US and China. I will stop there. Thank you very much, you. Professor Kupchan. Uh, very insightful uh, observations, uh, opportunities given to the Biden administration, but at the same time, uh, limitations, restrictions, whereby uh, the American foreign policy uh, cannot move freely. And also he uh, mentioned uh, the uh, openness uh, to the advice from, uh, advice from the allies to uh, the Biden, Biden foreign policy. So perhaps uh, South Korean government, uh, especially the, the, the foreign policy, foreign MOFA may have to take a note on that. Okay, uh, our second uh, presenter is going to be uh, Professor uh, Dong Sun Lee from Korea University. Uh, okay, why don't you start? Okay, first of all, um, my hearty congratulations on inauguration of uh, President uh, Biden and President Chun Jae Sung. <laughs> okay. Um, American unipolarity is on the way. Accordingly, um, Washington is formulating a new security strategy that can reconciliate, reconcile um, United States' strong will to leadership with its diminishing power position. Then what is that strategy? Um, America, I believe, is introducing what I call in a strategy of offshore leadership. Its main goal is to remain the most influential leader in security realm. Not the sole leader, but the first among equals. That strategy aims to attain this goal by establishing two things. First, establishing a sphere of influence or block firmly over maritime and coastal regions. 
as opposed to inland areas. With naval and air power as primary means. Um, I think this transition started uh, during the latter part of George W. Bush administration. Um, since Bush administration began to step back gradually from a hegemonic strategy of leading alone the entire international system during his second term, Washington has been accepting secondary leadership rules played by other great powers, such as China and Russia. Um, however, Washington, um, which still de desires to exercise certain extent of international leadership, is not currently adopting a strategy of offshore balancing or isolationism, as some scholars predict or advocate. Offshore leadership is different from isolationism or offshore balancing. Offshore balancing abstains from exercising leadership to the extent possible and only plays minimal roles essential for preserving balance of power. Isolationism rejects international roles altogether. Okay. So in other words, the United States presently is not pursuing a general retrenchment. Rather, it tries to share minor parts of its leadership rules with other great powers as necessitated by um, the latter's ascending power and assertiveness. To remain the most influential of all leaders, the United States makes efforts to maintain First, it's military economic supremacy. And second, um, expanding its bloc built around superior alliance portfolio. Um, let me turn to the first um, sort of means of um, being the most influential leader of the world, uh, maintaining supreme power. In order to husband its superior capabilities, the United States strives for a smart employment of all instruments of power. Accordingly, the United States has adopted a restrained defensive posture that reflects its relative power decline and fiscal problem, as well as lessons learned from the past excesses that um, Professor Kopchan talked about. It seeks to avoid using land power while instead relying on naval and air power to the extent possible. So this is what constitutes offshore part of the offshore leadership strategy. Okay. And in utilizing uh, naval and air power, Washington prefers coercion through threatened employment to actual application. The United States also wants to shift much burden to its allies as possible in conducting military operations, especially when it comes to uh, ground operations in particular. Yeah. The United States also has assumed a proactive diplomatic posture. Although the Trump administration backtracked from um, President Barack Obama's diplomatic measures, um, it made efforts to negotiate for new, hopefully more favorable deals with North Korea and Iran. President Biden declares now in his first major foreign policy speech Quote, diplomacy is back at the center of our foreign policy, unquote. In addition, um, Washington attempts to make the most of non-military instruments like commercial ties and international institutions for the purpose of maintaining its supreme position. 
Although President Trump decided not to join the newly formed uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership, he did maintain or refurbish the extent commercial arrangement he had inherit inherited from his uh, successors. Just NAFTA became uh, USMCA. It didn't disappear. And Trump presidency also saw a boom of economic statecraft in the form of economic sanctions. In addition, US, the US has tried to set clear priorities in foreign policy as its diminishing relative power makes untenable its old practice of taking on multiple tasks of varying urgency at once. Washington now assigns top priority to managing relations with great powers, as shown by the fact that President Biden pointed out China, Russia first among foreign policy challenges, many of them. Meanwhile, attention to terrorist organizations and rogue states like North Korea has relatively diminished. Uh, driving such readjustments in for priorities are manifested anxieties generated by China's rising power and Russia's growing assertiveness. And as Americans have not experienced large-scale terrorist attacks, such as since 9-11 incidents, and have concluded preventive war against Iraq was simply unnecessary, their threat perception on foreign terror organizations, as opposed to domestic uh, terror organizations and rogue states, has lowered to a realistic level. And the fact that a satisfactory solution is simply unavailable to the North Korean nuclear armament is another reason for Washington's reduced attention to rogue states. Okay, with um, America's renewed focus on great power relations, Asia has become central to American strategic thinking. Why? Because, um, I'm sorry, Asia is becoming what Hans Morgenthau dubbed uh, center of uh, world politics. Hence, United States pivot to Asia may be inevitable over the long haul. And the enhancement of uh, neighbor and air capabilities would constitute the backbone of uh, rebalancing toward Asia. This is because the United States envisions an essentially maritime strategy for Asia as its Indo-Pacific uh, strategy signifies. Okay, let me turn to the second um, sort of means or pillar of this offshore leadership strategy, which is building a superior bloc. In the crucial Asian region, the United States intends to consolidate its position of the most influential state by strengthening its grip on maritime and coastal areas of region. This means building a permanent US-led bloc of maritime coastal nations. For offshore balance, power like the United States relying primarily on naval and air capabilities, maritime area is a first priority, and coastal area the second. These areas provide optimal basis of operations. Moreover, controlling these areas, maritime areas in particular, is less difficult for an offshore power possessing naval and air super, uh, supremacy. Strengthening and expanding blocks as such uh, can add to US influence in two ways. First, by forging asymmetric partnership with lesser states, US can exact sizable leverage from their dependence on it. Second, by using this leverage, Washington can harness its partner's influence for shaping behavior of other states. In Asia, 
America has uh, made substantial progress in bringing into its block um, countries, uh, either maritime nations or cost, uh, coastal states sharing no land border with continental great powers like China uh, and or Russia. Um, and in addition, the United States is trying to bring on board um, India, Vietnam, and Myanmar, uh, which are coastal nations bordering China. While geographical uh, proximity can help China project its land power and thereby extend the influence over um, if more effectively to these countries, United States neighbor and air power can prove uh, equally competitive in these coastal areas. That's why United States is trying to um, extend its influence uh, as much as possible, because it thinks it can do that. A successful construction of the block anchored in maritime and coastal areas would suffice to place you, the United States in superior position vis-a-vis -vis China or Russia. Why? Because the bulk of Asia's wealth and strength are located there. This point is borne out by examining distribution of power among Asia's non-great powers, the group of states which Washington uh, vies with uh, Beijing or Moscow to win over. And on my uh, essay, I uh, put down some numbers uh, for you to see uh, whether the point I'm making has some empirical grounds. And uh, this implies that the United States heading the block of maritime and coastal nations would have substantial advantage over a China that commands all the inland areas. Um, reigning over maritime Asia alone would give Washington a fair chance to stop Beijing from holding the top. And maritime coastal bloc members with US aid and assistance can uh, deny United States, uh, I'm sorry, China, decisive victory in East and South China Sea, as well as the Taiwan Strait. The United States makes efforts to consolidate and expand its bloc, primarily with an eye to, of course, to China, an aspirant leader and emerging rival. To that end, Washington supports and thereby courts its present and prospective bloc members, which are expected to be reliant and therefore pliant. In order to minimize associated, associated costs, the United States primarily employs its superior naval, air, and nuclear capabilities while uh, limiting its use of ground forces to the minimum. Other instruments for strengthening ties and increasing influence include US-initiated commercial arrangements, such as free trade agreement and shared values like liberal democracy. We'll more frequently see uh, a um, so-called comprehensive strategic uh, alliance rising, such as the, uh, the US-Korean um, um, alliance. With commercial exchanges expanding, uh, the allies' asymmetric dependence on the larger, more advanced US economy would increase, therefore conferring greater influence on Washington. In, order, in addition, to the extent that democratic partners embrace the cause of ideological solidarity, the United States can legitimize its leadership as the liberal democratic icon of the world inculcating uh, liberal values to an authoritarian state like Myanmar is expected to raise its receptiveness, receptiveness to US soft power. Besides such acts of courting, the United States is 
uh, also demanding role expansion and burden sharing from its core allies, Japan, South Korea, Australia, that have firmly accepted American leadership and acquired substantial capabilities. In US strategic planning, these key allies must act as deputies and combine to constitute the core of Washington-led bloc. Washington's such demands were on a rising trend long before the raucous Trump era. Okay, let me uh, conclude. Um, United States made um, numerous mistakes um, during its heyday. And these failures, in tandem with other states' ascendance, has been eroding American unipolarity and thereby causing a steady transition in US international leadership. In Asia, the United States strives to remain the most influential leader inter alia by maintaining its supreme supremacy in naval and air power and establishing firm grip on maritime and coastal areas. Completion of this strategic transition will take quite some time. American unipolarity, especially its military component, is fading away only a sluggish pace, and learning about old and new systemic constraints is incom uh, incomplete and reversible. Nevertheless, there are regions to believe U.S. offshore leadership will arrive and stay long. This strategic option most befits both the U.S. will to lead and its unalterable geographical identity of maritime power. This strategy is particularly suitable for the dominant system of Asia, in which maritime and coastal areas contain the bulk of wealth and strength. Let me stop there. Thank you for listening. OK, thank you very much. Uh, uh, very interesting presentation, uh, Professor Lee. Uh, Professor Dong Sun Lee uh, suggested uh, probably offshore leadership, uh, which is a concept that he uh, just presented will be the uh, probably the new emerging security strategy of the United States in the coming decades. Uh, okay. Our third speaker is Professor Steve Chen uh, of the uh, University of uh, Colorado in Boulder. Uh, can you hear me, Professor Chen? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? That's good. good. Thank okay. you very much. Let's, let's go you. ahead then. Okay, thank you for uh, for your introduction. And I want to also start by thanking the Korean Association of International Studies for uh, organizing and hosting this event, for the Korean Ministry of Foreign Affairs for sponsoring this event, and finally for Professor Chung and Professor Wan and the staff of KAIS for, uh, for their helpful uh, assistance. I want to also uh, apologize to the other panelists for not being able to hear all their presentation. As I wrote in my chat message, I lost my connection three times <laughs> during this short period. I have no idea. I have no idea what happened. Uh, I would have very much loved to have heard what Charlie has to say about Sino-American relations. So I regret and apologize for uh, missing big parts of your talk. And also, I am crossing my fingers that I would not be disrupted again during my presentation, losing the connection a fourth time. Uh, let me also start by saying that there's a Chinese adage that candid remarks can be harsh to the ear, and good medicine can be bitter to the taste. So some of the things that I say may perhaps offend some of you, but I thought I would just speak my mind, and then perhaps we have a, uh, a vigorous uh, debate. I will start off by saying that 
uh, expect the Biden administration to more or less uh, continue the same kind of foreign policy as its predecessors. I think it's a reasonably safe bet that uh, to say that because many of the personalities nominated by the president are those who have served previously in the Obama administration. Uh, they have more or less the same outlook at the, as the Obama administration. Uh, moreover, I think, well, Biden wants to restore relations with the European allies, especially in Korea, Japan, Asian allies. Um, in other respects, I think uh, he will actually continue uh, Trump's uh, policy, at least with regard to China, for example. He has not pulled back, uh, for instance, he has not lifted the tariffs on, on Chinese goods uh, imposed by Trump. And in some ways, I think actually relations between the United States and Russia could actually be worse than during the Trump era. So I have some forebodings that we may be entering a uh, new Cold War. That to use uh, a familiar phrase, the winter may be coming. Uh, I would just simply refer to three concepts, and then I will move on to a one big uh, concluding uh, remark. And the three concepts, first of all, uh, refers to path dependency. What has happened has happened. And it cannot be taken back. And I think the damage done by the Trump administration has been very serious and even long lasting in its effect. Even the Europeans now are becoming more skeptical, less confident in the reliability of the United States as an ally. Not to mention China. In the case of China, uh, Beijing is very much offended, enraged by what they perceive to be uh, the United States reneging on previous commitments, tacit understandings, such as not to send high-level U.S. officials to, to Taiwan to meet with the Taiwanese uh, president, such as Alex Azar did that, uh, such as uh, Michael Stutterman, uh, the high-ranking rear admiral for the United States in charge of intelligence in the Pacific, as Kelly Craft was just about to leave to visit Taiwan before the change of administration. And most recently, the State Department of the United States released a picture deliberately to publicize a meeting between Taiwan's top envoy and, uh, and the acting deputy uh, secretary of state in charge of the Bureau of East Asian Affairs, uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Kim Kun, uh, and that meeting was actually held inside the State Department, again, in the view of Beijing. It's a violation of a longstanding practice and understanding. And they are, of course, very much upset by uh, the total amount of $5.1 billion of arms sales by the United States to, to, uh, to Taiwan. So I'm afraid that uh, it would take a long time uh, to restore the relationship. And the best we can hope is steady state, no further worsening of Sino-American relations. So again, uh, it's easy to destroy trust, confidence, mutual respect, and it would take a long time and much work to restore that. The second point it has to do with Winset, and I take this concept from uh, Robert Putnam's uh, well-known article about the interactions between the domestic and foreign levels of analysis. Uh, put it very simply, I think both for China and for the United States, the leader's wing set, that is to say the range of politically acceptable and feasible uh, bargaining solutions or outcomes will be shrinking. Uh, both uh, Xi Jinping and Joe Biden will be hemmed in by domestic considerations. Uh, to refer to an adage from Tip O'Neill, uh, the well-known U.S. congressman, all politics is local, and I think we can expect Trumpism to remain even after Trump has left. 47% uh, of the Americans voted for Trump, and whatever Biden does, he will be criticized for being soft on China or appeasing China. Uh, Farid uh, Zakaria wrote uh, not so long ago, last week, I think, 
that although Joe Biden has been very, very bold in domestic initiatives, his foreign policy has been actually quite timid. Uh, and I expect him continue to be, as I say, constrained, constrained by the uh, by the domestic situation. Uh, and speaking from China's perspective, China feels that it is in the crosshair of the United States domestic politics. That whereas the Democrats and Republicans rarely agree on anything else, they agree on China. Uh, so China feels that it's very much uh, the target of politicians uh, playing to the gallery. Clearly, Trump thought that the bashing China is uh, is a winning election strategy. He used the words like kung fu uh, and rape as a metaphor for China's predatory policies uh, for taking away American jobs and hurting Americans' wages. And from Xi Jinping's point of view, I think he faces the same domestic uh, constraints. Netizens in China are criticizing the government for being too soft on Taiwan and on the United States. As a generalization, I think uh, the Chinese general public is much more hawkish, much more confrontational than the elites. Uh, and that the current elites do not have the same charisma, discretion, if you will, as Mao Zedong and Xiaoping. And again, they are being increasingly hemmed by domestic opinion from making any overtures or concessions, perceived concessions to the United States. Uh, I happen to believe more in what Mansfield Snyder has have said about democratizing countries actually are more likely to get themselves into a conflict. So for those Americans who would like to wish China to become more democratic, to have more open political process, I think there is a negative side that has to be mentioned and has to be recognized. Um, and indeed, if one wishes China's economic growth were to stall or even to reverse, uh, we should be careful in making this wish because China whose economy has declined, uh, its rate of growth or its absolute growth has reversed, may be a far more dangerous China than a growing China. Uh, even without catching up, as Tom Christensen has said, China can be a problem, right? Without catching up, China can pose a problem. Uh, I actually think I read at least one, maybe two of the recent articles by Charlie, and he can correct me. One was single author, and one was with Peter Trumbowitz. Um, so if, if I'm making misattribution, Charlie can correct me. And I would very much agree with him that it is time for both sides, for both parties, to tamp down their rhetoric, uh, to, to be more pragmatic and to avoid rhetorical escalation. Uh, and I say for both sides, because reading the Chinese media, they have become more shrill, more confrontational, and even very much in some cases misleading. On the other hand, I think the United States has to do its part. Uh, some of you may remember that Mike Pompeo, in the last days of his tenure as the Secretary of State, condemned China for committing genocide, for confining Uyghurs in quote-unquote concentration camps. Now, the United States is the only country that has done that. The Economist has published two articles saying that this tends to be a hyperbole. One does not have to condone China's policies, but at the same time, it is unbecoming to use words that are not quite appropriate, because after all, the Chinese retort uh, that the United States has interned Americans of Japanese descent within living memory that Native Americans have been forcibly removed from their ancestral, ancestral lands uh, and forcibly relocated to quote unquote reservations. The Cherokee people, for example, had um, this so-called trail of tears. Uh, so before the United States lectures other people for committing uh, crimes against humanity, and it may want to look in the mirror. And one more thing, it's in the very recent past, that Christopher Warren Christopher, Martin Albright, and other high-ranking officials of the United States Department deliberately shunned the use of the G word, according to Samantha Power, no other, who has, of course, served in the Obama administration during the Rwanda genocide, simply because the United States Clinton did not want to intervene. The United States deliberately 
avoided using the word genocide in order to not have to face the legal consequences of the G word. So again, I mean, it does not stand the United States in good stead, enhancing its credibility um, to, to engage in such rhetoric. And of course, Tony Blinken has publicly endorsed uh, Mark Pompeo's uh, statements. Uh, to give you another example, which I think is necessarily inflammatory, that does not mean to condone or support Beijing's policies. Uh, many leading Americans have criticized those who stormed, stormed the Capitol, Trump supporters as insurrectionists and seditionists. But the same Americans have lauded those who are supporters of Hong Kong independence, who have stormed the Hong Kong Legislative Council and ransacked and trashed it uh, as, as pro-democracy demonstrators, right? So again, I, I think words do matter and this kind of rhetorical escalation uh, is not gonna be there hopefully. So I agree with Charlie's point of view about being more pragmatic and tone down the heat, uh, tone down the heat. Uh, Charlie, I think also mentioned uh, about uh, working with allies. And I think that's a very standard, very, very, uh, you know, very commonly agreed upon approach for the United States today. And Biden has indicated that he would do that. But in reference to my earlier point about past dependency, once trust is, is, is hurt, undermined, it would take a long time. In the recent, a long time to restore. In the most recent G7 meeting, for example, uh, clearly the French and especially the, the Germans have shown skepticism that while Britain was entirely enthusiastic in embracing America coming back, returning, um, the other European allies were more skeptical. And some of you may have read about London. Britain wanted to expand the G7 by inviting Korea, uh, India, and Australia. And that, I assume that balloon, that uh, overture, had been checked with Washington DC, and as I understand it, it got nowhere because some countries were very much concerned about this increased expanded group of G10 could be perceived as an anti-Chinese bloc. Even the, the, the Japanese were very reluctant to expand the group. So again, I would be very interested in hearing your comments. Uh, my point is, again, it's very difficult to put Humpty Dumpty back once. It's not just to say, oh, I'm sorry, uh, let's forget about the past. Let bygones be bygones. It's not so simple. Uh, and I would also think that from Beijing's point of view, this collective action, this reuniting of the alliance may appear to be the practice of uh, power politics, if you will. And that is not uh, helpful because it gives the appearance of containing China. And finally, I think Charlie mentioned about standing up for our values. And clearly, there are very many laudable values for the United States to stand up for. But at the same time, I want to say that one of the distinctions between uh, the Cold War and the recent years is that the Chinese have refrained from proselytizing, from preaching to the rest of the world, from engaging ideological competition, recruiting, uh, if you will, uh, fellow believers. In fact, China has deliberately refrained from exporting its model. So one would not want to invite them to get, get into this competitive ideological uh, race. And moreover, I think uh, there's another very important distinction between the cold days and nowadays. Uh, China is far more economically embedded in the global economy than Russia was ever, the Soviet Union was ever. So I would argue that economic interdependence and refraining from ideological um, crusades are two elements, two, two ballast, ballasts, if you will, two, two ballasts that, that steady uh, relations between China and the United States. And once we remove the economic interdependence aspect and the ideological competition aspect, then I think I worry about us returning to the bad old days. And again, I would like to hear the panel uh, commenting on that. So let me let me conclude uh, what faces the Biden administration. I have a somewhat different take from most people about what faces the Biden administration and other future US administrations. It is this. 
uh, I tend to believe that from the early 1950s on, they're having a grand bargain, a grand bargain between the United States and its allies, both in Asia and in Europe. In Asia, it has been known as the Yoshida Doctrine, Japan, which is, which means very much Japan and other countries uh, that follow Japan's uh, footsteps in terms of export-led growth, they agreed that they will accept political subordination to the United States. They will welcome American military protection. Uh, in exchange, they will have access to American capital that used to be very important to their less important, but more importantly, access to the US market. And they will use their revenues from exports to uh, recycle them by investing in the US dollar uh, so that the United States can sustain its fiscal and monetary extravagances to keep the music going, recycling the dollar. So that was the grand bargain. So why do I raise this? Uh, the, the grand bargain is in danger of unraveling. Uh, the dollar has depreciated. It's more and more difficult for other countries to accept that as a store of value. The importance of the U.S. market, and clearly the U.S. capital and technology have become less important for exporting countries like Japan, Korea, Singapore, of course, China. And uh, at the same time, China has become economically more important, has become the number one trade partner. And at the same time, the U.S. military dominance, while still very, very important and still powerful, uh, it is becoming uh, less so than before. And the need for U.S. protection has become more questionable. After the Cold War, the demise of the Soviet Union, the Europeans may want to ask who is going to invite, uh, invade us. And after the demise of Al-Qaeda, uh, it is also more questionable about the value, the worth of U.S. protection. And today, of course, from Beijing's point of view, it is only natural for the United States to build up the so-called China threat story in order to suggest to its allies that there is continued need for the indispensable U.S. Uh, to give them protection, okay? And my bottom line is this, while Americans may very well want to have allies engage in collective action to contain China, to contain China I'm not so sure that whether China's neighbors or even the Europeans are so interested I think their basic strategy is to refuse to choose. We do not want to choose sides. Uh, we want to play both sides. We want to be friends with both sides. So in that sense, I think the United States has an uphill fight uh, to get their allies to line up with it. Because again, I repeat myself, uh, from the rational perspective and from the reality of the situation on the ground, it works better for these allies to, to say we do not. Okay, so let me just stop here and uh, I will very much welcome comments and feedback. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Chen. Uh, he uh, laid out uh, the uh, US China uh, well, escalation of uh, you know, uh, feud or confrontation and uh, uh, he will posit somewhat a uh, critical view that uh, the current uh, situation between the two countries seems to be somewhat exaggerated, uh, the real uh, you know, uh, relationship between the two countries. And uh, while the, the, the China maintains uh, global uh, economic uh, you know, roles very much, uh, you know, uh, and contributing to the, the growth of the global economy. And, and at the same time, the United States still uh, remains as the number one uh, you know, military dominant power in the world. So the America's allies and partners seems to be in a difficult position and not really following, uh, well, according to his prediction, uh, not really following the, the American pressure to uh, join uh, the anti uh, Chinese uh, bloc or uh, efforts, joint effort, uh, you know, with an uh, uh, easy 
uh, decision. Okay, uh, well, we have three designated uh, well, discussants uh, waiting uh, for the, their time. Uh, the first uh, discussant will be uh, Professor Son byung of of uh, Jungang University. He may uh, mainly uh, talk about, about, uh, talk about uh, uh, Professor Kopchan's uh, presentation. Okay. You, you will have 10 minutes. Uh, I will be try to to be less than ten minutes. Um, you know, this is a as other presenters and discussions said, this is a great joy and privilege, both joy and privilege to join in this uh, prestigious conference on this uh, timely uh, uh, timely circumstances. And um, I enjoyed you know the presentations and the, the, the I learned a lot from. Uh, two presentations uh, conducted so far. And um, I couldn't read uh, Professor Kopchan's article uh, printed in The Atlantic. I only you know, read the paper he prepared for this conference, so I seek uh, Professor Kopchan's understanding for that. Um, let me start. Um, you know, I read from what I prepared. In his thoughtful and balanced discussion on internationalism and its relevance to future U.S. grand strategy, uh, Professor Kopchan argues that the American, first, the American foreign policy must learn from the merits of isolationism from the founding fathers in the 19th century. Second, that the isolationism, therefore, should not be treated unfairly, and that, but, that hasty uh, unilateral retrenchment, which American foreign policy in the 1930s uh, typified, can be as bad as the unrestrained global involvement U.S. has pursued in the night, uh, uh, from time to time since the Second World War. Throughout the paper, he, Professor Kopchan suggested that the new, the post-Trump grand strategy should be some point between what he says, doing too much and doing too little, which he is, which is uh, just a judicious, uh, judicious pullback or measured pullback. It's a pullback, but it should be judicious, it should be prudent, and it should be measured. After having gone through the turbulences of Trump administration for years, uh, whose foreign policy was harshly criticized as too much transactional and as equal to discarding the post-World War II U.S.-led multilateral and bilateral alliance of systems, U.S. foreign policy now seems to search for an alternative, optimal, grand strategy. In that process, Professor Gupchan warns the U.S. foreign policy makers not to categorically abandon what they should learn from the isolationism, I agree, and to calibrate future U.S. global involvement accordingly. Among other things, Professor Kopchan, Kopchan's argument seems to me the impression that the U.S. got passively entangled, not got actively involved. If my impression is wrong, uh, Professor Kopchan can correct me in his response time in global affairs from sometime around the late 19th century. And he also argues that, uh, gives the impression that the involvement around that time was not based on the scrupulous calculation of the cost and benefit. If this impression, my impression holds, is it true that, can you say that, the US haphazardly pushed itself, got entangled, not intentionally, strategically get involved, pushed itself outward to compete with the European powers, beginning with the US Spanish War and afterward. You know, uh, the famous uh, Frederick Jackson Turner, the author of The Frontier in American History, and William Appleman Williams, uh, the author of the uh, prestigious book to my mind, The Tragedy of American Diplomacy, will argue otherwise, I think. They may argue, different from uh, Professor Kupchan, Kupchan, that the exhaustion of the free domestic land and the malfunctioning of US capitalism led the frontier America. To, according to you know uh, Jackson Turner, and the corporate America, according to you know Williams, to actively search for and ventilating outlets abroad, 
thus paving the way for U.S. strategic uh, global involvement. The second point I'd like to take issue with is that Professor Kupchan seems to overly emphasize, to my mind, the legacy of the Founding Fathers' isolationism at, and its lingering influence throughout American history, particularly when Professor Kupchan uh, states in his article, this is quotation, a yearning for geopolitical detachment has from the outset imbued the American creed and has part and parcel the American experience, quote. I could concede that the isolationist sentiments must have prevailed much of the 19th century America. But that sentiment seems fit more with the national mood of the 19th century agricultural America, the Jeffersonian and Jacksonian Americas. But as we read from the American history, the US emerged uh, as the U.S. emerged as an industrial nation since the end of the Civil War in the uh, latter part of the 19th century, particularly in the North, there might have been some different you know, sentiment, which is expansionist, developing among the corporate and financial sectors and financial elites. I doubt, frankly, the monolithic and undifferentiated influence of isolationism was that strong. Uh, uh, beginning with the uh, le latter part of the 19th century. So I think we, need, we may need a more nuanced and differentiated explanation of the uh, isolationist influence. The last one I'd like to uh, raise is that um, uh, some different polls can show different aspects of fluctuating uh, American public opinion, particularly uh, with respect to the level of US involvement in foreign affairs. Uh, Professor Kupchan quotes in his paper several polls, uh, which he I think he think uh, directly and indirectly indicating the uh, the wide, broad, wide and broad you know isolation isolationist sentiment of American public. But you know some other polls say uh, I think uh, different aspects show different aspects of uh, American public opinion. For example. One of the 2019 Pew Research poll, which was released December 17, 2019, uh, you know, uh, suggests a quite different trend from the ones you know, uh, raised uh, by Professor Kupchan. In that Pew Research poll, 68% of the respondents says U.S. should take into account the interest of its allies, while only 31% of them says the U.S. should follow its own national interest. So, if this uh, poll holds, I think the you know internationalist sentiment is pretty strong yet in among the American public, although it was before uh, you know uh, presidential election. Other than that, 53% uh, of the respondents in the same poll says it is best for the future of our, of our country, for the, for America, to be active in world affairs. 53% more than you know, half of the American public, while 46% of them says we should pay less attention to problems overseas. You know, more than half of the American people still think that we have to you know, get involved. That's for the interest of the United States, the Pew Research says. So I generally agree with uh, Professor Kupchan that an increasing number of American foreign policy makers and the American public are more and more getting serious, really, about pursuing judicious retrenchment, avoiding, at the same time, avoiding rash disengagement. I agree that with that. The problem with that is twofold uh, in, in very, very uh, general sense. Uh, one is domestic one, and the other was uh, international one. Uh, domestically, I doubt the American public would easily concede that US global supremacy to any other nation. At the same time, however, this is a, you know uh, uh, this is different side of this uh, aspiration for supremacy. At the same time, however, the American public is less willing to pay cost that supremacy inevitably requires. For example, including station in U.S. troops in Korea, in Japan, and and Western Europe. This double standard, I guess, is inherent in American public since the World War II. Uh, 
which means that uh, 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 no, no. Uh, America first may get you presidency, but America isolated probably not. Which means that uh, U.S. presidential candidates in you know in every ele presidential election cannot easily persuade the U.S. public by saying that it's time for us to get you know inward, go isolate isolationist, and give up supremacy, and we have no choice but to live as one of the great powers. Any no, I cannot. You know, uh, I doubt any presidential candidate can say this to the American public and win the presidency. No, I don't think so. And the other point the, um, is that the, in, the international side one is that I also doubt U.S. allies can or is willing to tell the difference, difference between the judicious retrenchment and rash retrenchment, judicious one and rash one. Can Korea, can, can Korea tell the difference? Can Japan tell the difference? Can European allies tell the difference? They are retrenching anyway, whether it's a prudent one or rash one. I doubt that. I, would, I doubt that the, uh, you know, um, Koreans or Japanese can tell the difference between two types of retrenchment. So um, two modes, the two modes may look the same to some allies, so maybe triggering them to bandwagon and when we, we China or any other rising great powers here and there, which could be quite worrisome to US foreign policy makers. Let me stop here. Thank you. OK, thank you very much. Uh, our second discussant is Professor ji Lee of uh, American University. Is she online? OK, can you hear me? Yes, thank okay. you. Can you hear me? Yes, very good. You can go ahead now. Thank you so much, Professor Ma. First of all, I would like to um, thank the Korean Association of International Studies for this kind invitation um, to be part of uh, this important discussion. Um, I was asked to pre comment on Professor Dong San Lee's very interesting paper titled America's Emerging Security Strategy. Um, so what I will do is um, let me first briefly summarize his main argument, and then I will situate his argument in relation to the other two papers, and then the larger theme, and, um, and then I will actually get into uh, sharing some of my thoughts on his main um, argument and concepts. Um, so the central theme for this panel um, that, you know, the, the, the theme that runs through all three papers um, are the question of America's global role and continuity and change in U.S. ground strategy. Um, so Professor Lee's argument is that U.S. ground strategy can be characterized as offshore leadership. And uh, the point of departure for his argument is that United States desires to lead the world, whereas its capabilities in terms of military and economic power um, has declined vis-a-vis -vis other powers such as China. Um, so the offshore leadership strategy, therefore, is to um, design to maintain its status as the first and powerful military uh, power, but as the first among equals rather than as a hegemon or the sole leader. This strategy entails the establishment or consolidation of the United States um, sphere of influence um, in maritime regions and coastal areas. And the primary means uh, of power projection will be naval and air power as opposed to ground forces. Um, if I may situate his argument in relation to the other papers, um, you know, given that this, these papers are about grand strategy, uh, in terms of the causes of these strategic adjustment, um, um, Professor Kopchan's um, paper shed light on the internal, social, um, and cultural dimensions of isolationist and internationalist traditions that exist within the United States while Professor Chen uh, focuses more on the international pressures that arise from the changing balance of power between China and the United States. Um, so to Kopchen 
uh, American grand strategy resting on the interna international ambitions, quote, grows more politically insolvent. Um, by contrast, for uh, Lee, the basic premise of uh, Professor Lee's argument is that America's internationalist impulses will continue to shape American grand strategy. Like Chen, Lee broadly embraces a realist approach towards grand strategy, but views this newly emerging strategy and patterns captured in offshore leadership as United States being adopting a accommodationist strategy, um, whereas you know, Chan, Professor Chan actually argues uh, to me that he seems to suggest that the United States has failed to um, accommodate the rise of China. Um, since offshore leadership is at the heart of uh, Lee's argument, um, with some very important policy implications for the Biden administration, um, let me unpack this concept a little further. First, I think it is very helpful to think about this idea of strategy of offshore leadership in terms of how it is different from offshore balancing. Uh, like Professor Lee has stated in his paper, United States under the offshore balancing strategy um, will try to refrain from exerting leadership as much as possible and would not necessarily care about the character of the international order. Whereas under this offshore leadership, United States will care about the nature of the international order and continues to desire to lead the world uh, as, a, as a country that promotes the international order that rests on international institutions, democratic governments, free markets, and human rights. And second, I think the paper will actually benefit greatly from by uh, further clarifying the offshore leadership strategy, how it is um, differentiated from retrenchment. Uh, for example, uh, Kopchan talks about the need for the United States to judiciously pull back, but not to dangerously retreat. Relatedly, um, the question that I have for Professor Lee will be if Biden administration implements its Asia-Korea strategy based on this analytical concept of offshore leadership. How similar or different will the United States alliance with South Korea be? Um, Lee's articulation of offshore leadership does not really address, at least in the paper that I read, um, does not really address the question of the future of U.S. alliances, especially U.S. ground forces and force structure, those forces stationing abroad and its impact on American grand strategy. But I think this is an important question with very important policy implications for the Biden administration. For example, um, the paper seems to suggest that South Korea is under the U.S. Um, you know, sphere of influence. But how does that change if United States does indeed go ahead and, you know, um, pull the, the ground forces, um, you know, can we still call South Korea uh, still be under the U.S. sphere of influence? Basically, having a little more sense of this concept when it is applied to USRK alliance, I think that will be a very important question to ponder. Um, third, granted that the concept of ground strategy actually um, itself is related to the presence of one or more opponents in the international system, um, I think that the, pre the paper actually seeks to present somewhat of a duality. What I mean by this is that on the one hand, um, Professor Lee seems to suggest that you know United States is is willing to create room for China and Russia um, so that they will be equals as long as the United States is the first among the equals. But on the other hand, um, the paper seems to clearly indicate the United States desire to maintain its supremacy through the shared democratic values of liberal democratic allies and institutions that embody those values. Um, and these seems to uh, presuppose that the United States should maintain the liberal um, character of the international order. So lastly, but not least, um, it seems 
to me that the paper assumes that a lot more continuity than the other two papers. For example, um, the paper, uh, the, the temporal scope condition actually goes all the way back to the uh, Bush administration. But my question will be, has Trump actually altered US um, ability to lead? It's one thing that United States actually wants to lead, but it's another that um, others actually will basically accept US leadership the same way. So basically this question of whether Trump foretold the US, what US can and cannot do um, rather permanently in some important ways, despite uh, the Biden administration's uh, willingness to lead the world uh, as a team member. So to conclude, I greatly enjoyed reading the papers and I look forward to hearing um, the further articulation of this important uh, concept and the other panelists. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Lee. Uh, very insightful in deciphering the, the concept that uh, President Lee dong uh, proposed. Okay, our last uh, discussant it will be uh, President Park Jae-jok of the uh, Hanguk uh, University of Foreign Studies. Okay, thank you, uh, Professor Mar. First of all, uh, thank Kais uh, for having me here today. Uh, I'm very much honored to serve as a discussion for uh, uh, Professor Stephen uh, Chan's paper. I have been following uh, his work, and more importantly, I understand that Professor uh, Chen uh, was PhD supervisor of P uh, Professor Huang Jiwan, who was the general director of Kais. To me, uh, Professor Chan mainly provided three very interesting uh, points in a very clear manner. The first, the Biden administration is going to face very significant domestic pressure constraining uh, its venue for choice. Second, even if China were to become more democratic and to pursue more moderate foreign policies, it is uh, bound that there is going to be a tension, if not conflict, between the United States and China. The third, China is a status quo power, while the United States is a revisionist hegemon. Professor Chan did not elaborate the second point and third point in his presentation, so that I would say that uh, his presentation is a milder version of his paper. So with uh, these three uh, points in mind, uh, I would like to uh, make uh, two or three uh, questions and one comment just for the sake of uh, debate. First, with respect to Professor Chen's uh, point of the Biden administration being uh, constrained by uh, domestic uh, pressure, I was wondering how and in what direction the Biden administration would be strong, uh, hamstrung by domestic pressure in the area of international security. So I can uh, clearly see that Biden administration is going to continue to continue to pursue protectionism in order to champion the interest of US uh, middle class people. That said, what about uh, US security policies? One would you say the US would retrench from uh, its overseas commitment in order to assign more resources to domestic politics, even as it seeks to restore, quote, uh, restoring uh, America's standing in the world, unquote. I would say Professor Kupchan uh, would say that, yes, U.S. would retrench from its overseas commitment uh, based upon uh, his presentation today. On the other hand, Someone would argue that because of the very domestic constraint, U.S. would engage in more serious uh, trade disputes with China or more harsh on China with a group of uh, nations which Professor Chen uh, refers to as a team in order to champion the uh, economic interest of U.S. middle class. The second point I would like to make in relation to the first point is that 
Biden administration would be constrained not only by domestic pressure, but also the Democratic Party's traditional foreign policy platforms. Biden administration is a democratic government. Traditional uh, Democratic Party's foreign policy platforms focus more on human rights and uh, democracy. That said, if the United States applies it in a very strict manner in its relations with Southeast Asian and South Asian states, most of which are authoritarian states, U.S. would significantly uh, diminish its soft power rather than strengthening it with the image of, uh, of a value of providers, with the image of a value of preservers. That being the case, China uh, is likely to take the opportunity offered it to drive a wedge between the United States and its uh, regional states. As a result, U.S. Indo-Pacific strategy would be significantly damaged. Again, my point here is that the Biden administration would be hamstrung not only by domestic pressure, but also by the Democratic Party's traditional uh, platforms on, on security affairs. You know, to me, it is hard to imagine that uh, President Biden is going to shake hands with Cambodian uh, Prime Minister Hun Sen in 20, uh, 20, uh, 2022, next year, when Biden uh, attend the EAS, East Asia Summit. You know, the, the, the chair of the ASEAN meetings this year is Brunei, but the chair is going to be uh, uh, at uh, Cambodia's hands next year. So that, you know, to attend the EAS, I'm not quite sure whether Biden, President Biden is going to shake hands with President Hun Sen with a broad smile. The third uh, question, just you know, for the uh, academic curiosity, since uh, Steve, uh, Professor Chen uh, referred to China as a status quo state, while the United States as a uh, a strong, a strong uh, revision is the hegemon. I was wondering what would uh, all the sizable middle powers in this region that uh, maintain alliance relationship or security relationship with the United States be? So for example, you know, Australia, Japan, and South, South Korea maintain close alliance or security relationship with the United States. Then would, should they be called as a weak revisionist states? So if South Korea maintains, continue to maintain an alliance relationship with the United States, should we call it as a bandwagoning with the United States, since the United States is a revisionist hegemon, rather than balancing against China? My last point, which I uh, may disagree with Professor Chen's point, is the possibility that the United States connect US-led alliances to European countries, namely Great Britain, France, and, and uh, even Germany. The Biden administration is uh, seeking to convene the Quad Summit and the Conference for Democracy. The US has been raising the possibility of uh, extending Quad to Quad Plus uh, with uh, potential uh, plus states uh, being Great Britain, the France, uh, uh, and other European states, among others. The United Kingdom, uh, the host of this year's G7 meetings, already invited Australia, South Korea, uh, and India as a guest to, to, uh, guest to the G7 meetings this, uh, this year, held in London in June, as Professor Chan mentioned. Several hours after the third uh, ministerial quad meeting was convened, Secretary of State uh, Blinken uh, had a conversation with Great Britain, France, and Germany. So concern that uh, anti concern that uh, concern that anti Chinese bloc would be formed, Xi Jinping, the president of China. 
uh, criticize such a grouping as a selective minilateralism in a keynote speech at this year's Davos Forum. So despite a strong uh, Chinese criticism, U.S. is now seems to aspire to connect the regions in a way that create a new and broadly based U.S. alliance or security network. So in this sense of a connecting U.S.-led alliances to Western alliances system, it is worth noting what John Eikenberry claimed in the article he contributed to foreign policy several years ago. He claimed that U.S. unipolar moment is going to end. If the defining, defining struggle between the, the defining struggle of the 21st century is between U.S. and China, China is going to take the advantage. However, if the defining struggle of the 21st century is between China and a revived Western system, the West will triumph. So I would like to ask whether Professor Chen, well, you know, the other two presenters, think that a revived, a revived Western system will uh, become a reality or will remain, as, uh, remain a fantasy. From uh, his presentation, I sense that Professor Chen would say that it is going to remain a fantasy. But I would love to hear from the other two presenters uh, how they think this possibility. I'll stop here and thank you for your kind invitation. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we have uh, about uh, 20 minutes left uh, before uh, noon. And I will ask our presenters, uh, we already collected a lot of uh, questions and comments, so our uh, presenters may uh, respond to those uh, questions and, 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 and comments uh, as they like. Uh, Professor Kopchen, are you still there? Okay, you, you can start. Sure. <clears throat> um I thought the, the comments from all three discussants were, were excellent and, and very interesting. Uh, and um, it, in some ways, what I, what I maybe I'll do is, is just pick up on the, the last point that was made. Um, you know, in terms of the, <clears throat> the comments that were made on my paper, they were, they were I thought, excellent and, and nuanced. My, my one broad comment in reply would be, it's complicated. Uh, and that I think the Trump era brought light on the contested nature of American internationalism. Um, and so I'm not, uh, uh, I, I take your point about overstating the influence of the founding fathers, uh, overstating the degree to which uh, the 19th century can teach us things about the 21st century, but there is a very fluid political situation here in the United States. Both Steve and I talked about it, the, the press of domestic business, the, the impact of polarization on, on foreign policy. So I, uh, you know, my message here is let's not take for granted that, that the internationalism of the pre-Trump era is the, the norm and that we can, we can rest assured that Biden is going to take us back to liberal internationalism, a la the, 19, the 1990s. Um, you know, on the, I thought the concept of offshore leadership uh, is very interesting. Um, I liked Professor Lee's questioning of what's the difference between offshore leadership and offshore balancing. Uh, and that maybe that gives us some way of, of uh, looking at what's the difference between good retrenchment, smart retrenchment, and rash retrenchment. Does that, does that difference between offshore leadership and offshore balancing give us a purchase on that issue, insight into that issue? And, and my final point would be uh, on this question of, is a democratic alliance possible? Um, will Biden succeed in, a, in creating a revived West to stand up to Trump? I guess I'd really like to throw it back 
to those of you in Korea uh, and to and to pick up on Professor Lee's good question, you know, can can the U.S. lead? Uh, are countries like South Korea asking whether the U.S. is reliable? Right. We've gone from Clinton to Bush to Obama to Trump to Biden. Who knows what's next? Uh, is is there a, a certain hedging that's going on because you don't know where the United States is going to head. And as a consequence, you're not going to put all of your marbles in the American basket. I pose that as a question to those of you in, in Seoul and who, who focus more on, on Asian security than I do. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, next speaker, uh, Professor Lee dong -sun. Thank you. Lots of uh, good questions and comments. Um, first of all, um, let me turn to the, um, how we differentiate between um, offensive leadership and uh, uh, offshore leadership and offshore balancing. Um, to my understanding, you know, uh, my, um, offshore balancing has a bug passing logic at its core. So offshore balancer usually pass the buck to maintain the balance of power until it becomes uh, absolutely necessary for that power to intervene, okay? But um, on the other hand, I think offshore leadership uh, focuses on the leadership part. It does not pass the buck. Sometimes it share burdens, but the key focus lies in leading and make sure other countries depend on the leader. That generates the leverage and influence for um, uh, the, the leading country. So there is a clear difference uh, between those two. Uh, but unfortunately, I sort of um, use the similar expression, the, the offshore that makes um, these two distinct concepts less um, distinctive. Um, but that's path dependency. I chose that word in 1917. I cannot just change it. And retrenchment. Um, when it comes to retrenchment, my uh, offshore leadership uh, falls into the category of partial retrenchment, not general retrenchment. But how far? How far retrench? Um, retrenchment, partial retrenchment to the maritime and coastal region. That's what I mean by offshore leadership. That's the, what offshore stands for, um, maritime and um, coastal. So maybe um, offshore leadership concept has more concrete content than just retrenchment or, um, you know, um, or pulling back and other um, uh, lesser, um, less um, uh, concrete um, um, concepts. Okay, um, then let me turn to the accommodation um, issue. I think United States has shown a willingness to accommodate, but again, there is a limit. As long as China or other great power stays within the inland area, then that's fine. You can lead all the inland countries. But the United States is not accepting other great powers' intrusion into the maritime areas. And that's why the United States is uh, clashing with China over you know, Taiwan Strait, East China Sea, South China Sea, and other sort of father sea, blue oceans outside. And the United States has a serious issue with this so-called maritime Silk Road um, plan because it's maritime in its essence. And the second clash point between the United States and China is the fact that the China is a coastal nation. It's not an inland nation. So its presence in a coastal region itself makes the coastal region of Asia as a gray area 
in which China's land power and the United States' naval and air power can equally compete. So that's why there is a still a competition going on between China and the United States, even though the United States has been more willing to accept China's leadership or Russia's leadership in the inland region. Okay, what if US, US pulls its ground forces from South Korea? What happens? I think very little. Why? Because the United, uh, if you look at the map, South Korea is a coastal nation, um, geographically speaking, but geopolitically speaking, since North Korea lies between uh, China and South Korea, and there is simply no chance that North Korea would allow Chinese troops on its border to South Korea. South Korea is like an island, offshore island to China. So it belongs to the maritime region of Asia in ge geopolitical sense. That means that the United States can use its superior naval and air capabilities to protect and support um, um, South Korea, even without any ground forces on the ground. So that's my answer to uh, Professor Lee's um, um, astute um, comment. And liberal international order. Um, okay, what I'm th thinking about is this. If United States adopts, indeed adopts and fulfills the goal of offshore leadership, then the liberal international order will become more geographically bounded. It would not be a global order. It would be an order limited to the maritime and coastal region. Okay, that's what's going to happen, I believe. And second is liberal international order as a result of America's offshore leadership will become less liberal. Why less liberal? Because in order to expand the block, the United States need to be more light on emphasizing liberal values because if the United States emphasize liberal values too much, it will just scare off other you know, authoritarian potential partners. And that's not good. So the United States will put less emphasis on liberal part. So liberal international order will be there, but it will be more geographically bounded and with a less liberal emphasis. And finally, Trump factor. I think um, Trump was not an aberration from my perspective um, when it comes to offshore leadership um, developing in Washington. Um, Trump was very heavy on offshore part of the strategy. He wanted to pull ground troops out and he wanted to build up uh, naval, air, and nuclear forces, okay? And I think he was, didn't want to sort of get involved in inland areas like uh, Afghanistan, you know, Iraq anymore. So he, um, under his watch, I think U.S. Uh, security strategy become more offshore-oriented than before. So he, that's what his contribution to the uh, general direction toward the offshore leadership. But on the other hand, um, Trump was light on the leadership part. That's where he sort of over-corrected. Um, uh, he underestimated the elites and public's desire to lead the world as first among equals. And that's why I believe he lost last election Okay. But now I think uh, Biden is bringing back and reinforcing that leadership part of the offshore leadership. So that his contribution will be uh, on that part of um, uh, strategy. And of course, Trump uh, damages the US power, uh, both hard and soft, and that uh, accelerated the waning of American unipolarity. And um, uh, actually, I, I believe that uh, will 
contribute to the uh, um, the the, the um, uh, leading to the fact that um, uh, American strategy will become um, less leadership oriented because it has less sort of um, capabilities to lead um, because of the uh, Trump's you know mismanagement of politics and economy and all other international affairs. But I think you know he um, sort of. Uh, Again, I mean, he made U.S. strategy and military posture more offshore-oriented, and that's how he contributed to this general trend toward um, offshore leadership. And finally, reliability issue. I mean, we all know that the United States has never been a reliable ally. Why? Because it's across the ocean, right? It, it just has no vital interest in other areas than the Western Hemisphere, especially North America. It has been rely, unreliable. But why the United States has the most allies and black members? Because it's the least unreliable great power on the earth. I mean, China, think about China, South Korea relying on China, Russia, Japan. It's, it's simply unthinkable. So I think you know, unreliable American reduced unreliability matters, but it's not a game changer altogether because the United States is, is still the least unreliable great power on the earth. Okay, thank you. Okay, our final uh, response from the Steve Chen. <laughs> Thank you very much. I uh, really appreciate all the comments. The discussions really made some excellent points and raised some excellent questions. In fact, they have stated my case better than I could myself have said, so I appreciate it. And this, for the sake of time, let me just combine some of the questions or comments together and make three points. Indeed, I think Biden is hemmed in, hamstrung, not only from the right, but also from the left. Uh, the progressives, like Bernie Sanders. Uh, in some ways, uh, Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump share a lot uh, in common in terms of their policy preferences, isolationism, protectionism. Uh, so if I'm correct, I see the danger of the middle represented by Biden eroding. The middle is eroding. Uh, it's becoming more difficult to govern, to formulate domestic or foreign policy. So that's my first point. So this includes the domestic, uh, the democratic traditional platform, right? So it incorporates the Bernie Sanders wing of the party. The second point is what should the China's neighbors do and what have they done? And I think it's a, it's been a misnomer in the literature to call uh, policies by the United States, its European allies and Asian allies as quote unquote balancing against Russia or China. I would call it bandwagoning. If you go with Kenneth Watts, his argument is always that uh, you balance against the strongest of the great powers. And the United States clearly has been the strongest. In fact, what the Europeans and the Asians have done is to bandwagon with the United States. Remember that the alliance with Korea, with Japan, happened long before China was rising in the 1940s, late 40s and 50s. One could not talk about China's threat at that time. China even today cannot even invade Taiwan. And one needs to recall that Chinese troops left North Korea shortly after the armistice. The United States troops are still in Korea. Does South Korea really need the United States for protection? Uh, that's not just simply a rhetorical question. Uh, the first Secretary General of NATO has, in his moment of candor, said, what is NATO for? To keep the Germans down, the Russians out, and the Americans in. So that leads to my third point. And the point is that there is a consistency in British and American foreign policy which is to prevent another regional hegemon from arising, whether in Europe or in Asia. Uh, whenever France was threatening to become too strong, Britain 
uh, worked in favor of Germany. And when Germany became too strong, Britain tilted toward France. Britain, as the saying goes, has no permanent friends or enemies. It only has permanent interests. And of course, when the Soviet Union became uh, too powerful, the United States and Britain opposed that. If you look at Asia, the United States worked against Japan when Japan was too powerful. And today, when China is too powerful, it seeks to contain China. So it swings its weight to support the weaker of two parties. And if you look at the Middle East, it's the same thing. Supporting Iraq or Iran, Saudi Arabia or Iran. It's really a question of divide and rule. Uh, again, I think the realists are closer to the mark when they say ideology and the rest really do not matter. It's real politics. Uh, just think one for one moment, and I will say this and then conclude. The United States and China got along quite well during the Nixon, Ford, and Carter administrations, when China was much more authoritarian. The United States joined China to contain the Soviet Union. The United States was more supportive of Taiwan when it was under one party military martial law and authoritarian regime of Chiang Kai-shek. When Taiwan starts to liberalize and democratize it, the United States abandoned Taiwan. So basic logic tells me that democracy doesn't really represent the most important uh, consideration or even, uh, well, let me just leave it that way. So I tend to believe that people like Mir Sharma, even though I disagree with him a great deal, at least they have intellectual honesty to admit what I call a spade of spade. So bandwagoning, not balancing, uh, not support for democracy, really, for checking any other country from becoming another region of hegemon uh, and being hemmed in both by the left and the right, uh, the eroding middle. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, we have uh, finished uh, presentation and discussions and reply to those uh, discussions. Uh, I think uh, this is a very fruitful and very lively uh, discussions uh, about the, the new American administration's uh, policy direction and uh, the constraints and aspirations of uh, the Biden administration. Still, we, we, we have to wait a, lo a little bit more and see if uh, between the aspiration of uh, being a leader of the world and uh, the, the, the domestic and international constraints which uh, restrain uh, the, uh, the the American leadership. So, well, there are something we have to wait and see. But I think uh, our discussion presentations and discussions today lay out uh, basic uh, well conceptual foundations that uh, which uh, aspect we have to see in the near future. And uh, well, thank you very much for all the participants uh, for contributing to this uh, very successful uh, uh, session. And we will have a lunch break until 1 o'clock uh, Korea time. And uh, the, our second panel resume at 1 o'clock. Uh, our second panel, which deals with the, North, well, the US-China relationship, will be uh, uh, conducted and carried out in Korean language. And our third panel, uh, which will start at 3.30 uh, 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 PM, uh, uh, mostly uh, dealing with uh, the Korean-U.S. Re uh, alliance relationship uh, will be uh, conducted in, in, in English language. Thank you very much once again uh, for your active participation. Thank you. <laughs>